the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems 2020 version. Those of you who are already familiar with the ELSIP are probably noticing that in some very important ways, it looks different. Um, and for some very good reasons, it looks different. Up at the top, lagging skills. Now there used to be 23 lagging skills. We've shortened it to 18 lagging skills. Um, these are the skills. And by the way, not an exhaustive list of lagging skills, a representative list of lagging skills. If I had tried to be exhaustive about all the skills, the research tells us unlucky kids could be lacking, the ALSIP would be five to 10 pages long. And then it would take a whole lot longer to complete. You don't need five to 10 pages of lagging skills to get the right lenses on. You need 18 of them. These are some of the skills that are causing kids to respond to frustration so poorly. And what we're gonna do is check those lagging skills off. Um, and I'll teach you how in a few minutes, but I don't think you, I don't, you know, I don't think you even need me to teach you how to check off the lagging skills. You just read the lagging, uh, actually there's a few nuances to it, believe it or not. So I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. Down at the bottom is where you're gonna be writing in unsolved problems. Let me tell you a few things about this. The fact that there is a place to check off lagging skills often misleads people into thinking that the ELSIP must be a checklist. I'm delighted to tell you that it is not. Then it must be a rating scale. Nope, not that either. Um, I think those of us who work with unlucky kids or live with them are often asked to check too much. I think we're often asked to rate too much. And of course, what are we busy checking and rating? Behaviors, the signals. What do we do with our checks? We count them. What do we do with our ratings? We tabulate them. All so that we can come up with a total score. All so that we can compare this kid's total score to total scores of other kids of the same age, grade, gender. All so that we can tabulate what has become the holy grail of assessment a percentile that will somehow communicate to us whether this kid needs our help. I've never had a percentile tell me whether a kid needed my help and I've never had a percentile tell me what kind of help a kid needed. So if the ALSIP is neither a checklist nor a rating scale, then what is it? It's a discussion guide, it says it right there at the top in red makes it crystal clear. This is a discussion guide, a guide for bringing people together to discuss a kid's lagging skills and unsolved problems. You want to get everybody on the same page? Checklist isn't going to do it. Discussion will. You want to get everybody talking the same language? Checklist isn't going to do it. Uh, discussion will. You want to persuade the unpersuaded? Checklist isn't going to do it. A discussion will. We're going to have us a discussion. And if this is in a clinic, we're going to get both parents or grandparents maybe even to in on that discussion. If this is in a school, we're going to make sure that anybody who has anything to do with this kid in the building is in on this discussion. It is worth the logistical hurdles to make sure that anybody who has anything to do with this kid in the building is in on the discussion. Because if I've often been mortified to learn that in many schools, the paraprofessional or the ed tech doesn't get to come to the meeting where we're talking about the kid. I'll just repeat that. The person who's spending most of the time with the kid doesn't get to come to the meeting where we're trying to figure out what's going on with the kid crazy. Art specialists frequently don't get to come. Art doesn't get to come. Music doesn't get to come. Phys ed doesn't get to come. Bus driver doesn't get to come. When we do not involve people in identifying the information that's been missing, we have relegated them to an approach to intervention I refer to as winging it. Winging it. It's the winging it approach to intervention. And one thing these kids let us know continuously, winging it, isn't gonna cut it. 
not with these kids. By the way, if you leave these people out of the meeting, you have just missed out on an incredible opportunity to help change their lenses and help them participate in that process. Since you do not need an ALSIP on every kid in the building, just the 10, 20, 30 kids in the building, depending on the size of the building, who you're worried about the most or who are accessing the school discipline program the most, in other words, the kids we are in the midst of losing, um, it's worth the logistical hurdles for those 10, 20, 30 kids. Now, a few more points. What the ALSEP helps us focus on are the things we can actually do something about. Before there was an ALSEP, um, I call this the pre-ALSEP era. Before there was an ALSEP, I used to sit in meetings and people would say things with a very grave tone, like, you know, Tommy was conceived out of wedlock. This actually happened. And I had never heard that before. So I said, he, he was? And you say that's why he's challenging. And with a perfectly straight face, they said, well, you know, kids were conceived out of wedlock. And I said, I do? Wait a minute. I know a lot of kids were conceived. 50 to 60% of the kids in North America these days have been conceived out of wedlock. I know a lot of kids were conceived out of wedlock and most of them are doing just fine. Plus being purely practical here, which is the point, what can we do about the fact that the kid was conceived out of wedlock? Aren't we a little late to the show on that one? Um, uh, if we're a little late to the show on that one, and if we can't do anything about it, then why are we sitting here talking about it right now? I wouldn't be sitting here talking about it right now. You know, he was exposed to substances in utero. Well, now that's not good. I'd be the first to agree it is not good for a fetus to be exposed to substances in utero, but here's what I've seen happen all too often. Um, for the next 10 to 12 years, pretty much all people say about the kid is that he was exposed to substances in utero, something about which we can now do nothing. We have got to move on to the lagging skills and unsolved problems that may, but also may not, will never know for sure, be attributable to the fact that this kid was exposed to substances in utero or was born a month prematurely or has a trauma history or is on the autism spectrum. I was at an autism conference in uh, Denmark about a year and a half ago, if I remember correctly. And a mom was sitting in my group and she raised her hand very tentatively. And she said, um, I found my daughter's autism diagnosis to be very useful. I said, good. She then said, but I think what you're saying is that my daughter's autism diagnosis really didn't tell me very much about her specific lagging skills and unsolved problems. I said, right. She pondered it a bit further and then she said, and I think what you're saying is that once I figure out what her lagging skills and unsolved problems are, I'm going to learn that her autism diagnosis wasn't telling me very much at all. I said, right. The ALSIP helps us focus on the things we can actually do something about. So in an ALSIP meeting, we're not talking about the kid's behavior. That's just the signal. We're not talking about the kid's diagnosis. That's probably just a summary of the kid's signals. We are certainly not doing our favorite thing, trying to explain how this kid got to be this way. No theories. You can't explain how this kid got to be this way, not with any level of precision. All we're talking about in an ALSIP meeting is the information that's been missing. What are this kid's lagging skills? Because we've got to get the right lenses on. Lagging skills, not lagging motivation. What are this kid's unsolved problems? So we know what we're working on. And if we're solving those problems collaboratively and proactively, not only will the problems get solved, 
Not only will the behaviors that are associated with those problems subside, but the skills the kid is lacking will be enhanced. All right, let's get to it. Everybody in the meeting gets a blank copy of the ALSEP. The kid is not in the meeting. Um, you might be thinking, uh, aren't we trying to be collaborative here? Yep, everything you do in this meeting is gonna propel you into collaboratively collaborating with the kid. But um, there's things we wanna talk about in this meeting that we actually don't want the kid to hear. And plus the kid will never be aware of all of the lagging skills and unsolved problems we identify that would be overwhelming. The kid is not in the meeting. As you already know, you're gonna start with the lagging skills in the top section. You're gonna check off all of the lagging skills that apply to that kid one at a time. You're going to ask the people in the meeting, does this lagging skill apply to this kid? Checking off a lagging skill is not a democratic process. If two people say, oh, he's definitely lacking that skill, and four people say, I'm not seeing it, check. Checking off lagging skills is the easiest and fastest part of using the LSEP. Um, it should take you no longer than three to five seconds to check off a lagging skill. We're not splitting hairs. We are not obsessing. Three to five seconds, you either check it or you don't, move on. There are 18 lagging skills. You can do the math. The lagging skill section should take us no longer than two minutes to complete. Those of you who know the old LSIP know that this is a very big change. Here's big change number two. After you complete the lagging skills section, you are now done with the lagging skills section or you, and you are now moving on to the unsolved problem section. That is not how we used to do the LSIP. In the old LSIP, we would use those lagging skills as prompts to help us think of unsolved problems. But now, you have different prompts in the unsolved problems section. It is those prompts that are going to help you think of unsolved problems. How long should it take you to write or type in an unsolved problem? About a minute, a minute each. So if this kid has 30 unsolved problems, then your LSAT meeting should last about 32 minutes. If this kid has 50 unsolved problems, and he very well might if the kid's been having difficulty for a very long time, then your LSAT meeting is going to last 52 minutes. If you're thinking that that's a very long time, I want you to think about just how much time we've been spending on this kid dealing with outbursts that are a reflection of the fact that he still has a lot of problems that haven't been solved yet. You want to identify as many unsolved problems as possible for each prompt. Here's what it would sound like in a real LSIP meeting. Let's say that you have six high school teachers assembled around a table. Uh, this is a true story, but using the old LSIP. So I'm going to translate this story into using the new LSIP. Um, let's say that um, we've now completed the lagging skill section and that it took approximately two minutes. But those were two very important minutes. We don't want to be perfunctory about those two minutes. We want to be exhaustive about those. We want to be reflective about those two minutes because those two minutes are what help people shift from motivational explanations for why this kid is responding to frustration so poorly is unlucky on to lagging skills. Now we're moving on to the unsolved problem section. Here's, let's say that we're doing this in a school, which is the example that I'm giving. We've now completed the lagging skills section. Let me go with the first prompt. Are, the spe are there specific tasks, expectations, the student is having difficulty completing or getting started on? Now let me go to the true meeting because somebody could still say the same thing. Let's say the science teacher says, yeah, we're going to say when. Now here's the deal. 
there's a pretty good chance because in people who are new to the LSIP that they're not going to know the information we're looking for yet, that what they're going to start with is behavior. That might sound like this, the signal. She always gets upset and runs out of the room. Well, that's just the behavior. That's not the problems causing the behavior. Apparently, Teresa is a runner. What do runners do when expectations outstrip the kid's ability to meet those expectations? What do runners do? They run. Why do runners run? Because they're runners. That's what runners do. Hitters hit, spitters spit, screamers scream, criers cry, but runners run. What makes Teresa run? We don't, we don't know yet because we've been too busy talking about her running. When she's reading something she doesn't understand. Ah, now we're hovering over an unsolved problem. Uh, got some more, it's not specific enough yet. You'll see that on the next slide that I show you. Um, got some more questions to ask, like what's she reading that she doesn't understand? Science, always science. What's she reading in science that she doesn't understand? Well, I don't know. Think about it. We're not in a hurry. Being in a hurry is why helping Teresa has been taking so long. Well, I really don't know. I think I've been so focused on her running that I haven't been very focused on what's been causing her running. All right, then. We're gonna run with what we've got. Are you telling me that Teresa's having, here we go, this is exactly the way we're gonna word it in the unsolved problem section in the LSIP. Difficulty, as you'll see in two slides, all of your unsolved problems are gonna start with the word difficulty, followed by a verb, you'll see soon. Difficulty, reading, good verb, the assigned material in science. Well, yes, good, let's write it in. Next question, are you now done with that prompt? No, no, no. You're gonna get as many unsolved problems out of that prompt as you possibly can. So now I'm gonna ask again, any other expectations? Teresa's having difficulty, uh, any other specific tasks or expectations that Teresa's having difficulty completing or getting started on? The math teacher said, yeah. I asked, when? The math teacher said, well, she always gets upset and runs out of the room. There you have it, confirmation. We got a runner on our hands. Of course, we knew that three years ago. We're not sitting here talking about Teresa still because of what we already knew. We're sitting here talking about Teresa still because of what we didn't know. When she's using the computer, all right, now we're hovering over an unsolved problem. It's not specific enough yet. You'll see in two slides. Got some more questions to ask. Uh, what's she supposed to be doing on the computer? Math. What's she supposed to be doing on the computer during math? Well, she's supposed to use this special software, but it never works. Got it. Now I'm ready to write it. Are you telling me Teresa's having, here we go again, difficulty. All your unsolved problems are gonna start with the word difficulty using, good verb, the software on the computer during math? Yes. Good, let's write it in. You might be wondering, why is he saying yes like that? Because people say yes like that during LSIP meetings when they suddenly stumble across all of the unsolved problems they could have been busy solving with this kid for God knows how long if they hadn't have been so doggone focused on the kid's behavior. Now, if we were in pure behavior modification mode, what would we be doing with Teresa? We'd be um, punishing her when she exhibits the running signal we'd be rewarding her when she exhibits the replacement signal for running that we've trained and retrained. And you know what? If you did that, maybe you'd make a dent in her running signal and maybe you wouldn't, but I'll tell you something you definitely would not have done. Would you yet know anything 
about the difficulty Teresa is having using the software on the computer during math? And would you have yet done anything about it? Nope. Would you yet know anything about the difficulty she's having reading the assigned material in science? And would you have yet done anything about it? No. And now the clincher. Once you solve those problems with Teresa, is she still running out of the classroom over them anymore? Nope. See, it's only unsolved problems that cause challenging behavior. Solved problems don't. All right. The last piece you'll have to digest here is the wording of the unsolved problems. And unfortunately, this comes at the end of me teaching you how to use the ALSA, but it's actually the hardest part. Why is the wording of the unsolved problem so crucial? Because the wording of the unsolved problem on the ALSIP is going to translate directly into the words that you're going to use when it comes time to introduce the unsolved problem to the kid, when it comes time to solve the problem together, once again, what I'll be talking about tomorrow, poorly worded unsolved problems often cause the entire problem solving process to come to a dead stop before it even gets started, I call that failure to launch, all because of how we worded the unsolved problem, all because of how we worded the unsolved problem. So there are four guidelines to help you word unsolved problems well. And once again, the goal was not to make it harder to write unsolved problems. We want this to be as easy as possible it does make it harder to write unsolved problems, at least until you're good at it. The goal is to um, make it more likely that the kid is actually gonna talk to you after you introduce the unsolved problem. So there are four guidelines. Let me go through them with you. Guideline number one is probably the easiest. The wording of the unsolved problem contains no challenging behavior. So in other words, you are not writing in gets upset and runs out of the room when trying to read the assigned material in science. Gets upset and runs out of the room is out, replaced by the word difficulty. Difficulty reading the assigned material in science. Now you might be wondering why. Why leave the challenging behavior out? Two reasons, reason number one. You want to make sure that everybody in your LSIP meeting knows the behavior is not the unsolved problem. The expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting that's causing the behavior is the unsolved problem. Reason number two, if you keep the be challenging behavior in the wording of the unsolved problem, and the wording of the unsolved problem is going to translate directly into the words that you use when it comes time to introduce the unsolved problem to the kid, then you're gonna be throwing the kid's challenging behavior at him. When you're trying to solve a problem with him, he's gonna think he's in trouble, he's gonna get defensive, and he is now far less likely to participate in the process. This is collaborative. You need the kid to participate in the process. The challenging behavior is out. When you're implementing this model, you're not talking with kids about their challenging behavior anymore. That's just the signal. Guideline number two, also fairly easy. The wording of the unsolved problem contains no adult theories. So in other words, you are not writing in difficulty, very good start, using, good verb, the software on the computer during math, great unsolved problem, stop there because, uh-oh, no, 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 not because, don't do because, She's adopted. Um, I know she's adopted, but how does that have anything that comes after the word because, including the word because, out. Why? Two reasons once again. Reason one, number one. While we adults love to believe that our theories are usually right, the reality is that our theories are usually wrong. We think they're right. They're wrong more often than they're right. That's why I tell people I'm trying to lead an assumption-free life. I call it assumption-free living. 
not that big of a deal. It's actually kind of fun. But the minute I feel an assumption kicking in, I get rid of it as quickly as possible. It's probably wrong. It's also very freeing because you know what you're freed up to do when you're not busy assuming? You can ask. You can ask. And your number one source of information on what's making it hard for a kid to meet a particular expectation is the kid. No offense, but it's not you. As I'm always telling caregivers, it's not your job to know. It's your job to know how to find out. And we'll be covering how to find out tomorrow when we start talking about how to solve problems collaboratively and proactively. Some of you are also now wondering, yeah, but what if the kid's nonverbal? I'm not taking it back. Your number one source of information on what's making it hard for a kid to meet a particular expectation is the kid will find a way. I'll talk about that tomorrow too. Uh, reason number two, the wording of the unsolved problem on the ALSIP is gonna translate directly into the words that you're going to use when it comes time to introduce the unsolved problem to the kid. If you keep the theory in, here's what it's gonna sound like. I've noticed you've been having difficulty using the software on the computer during math because you're adopted. What's up? If the kid's got attitude, the kid's gonna look at you and say, what are you asking me what's up for? You just told me what's up. If the kid doesn't have attitude, the kid's gonna sit there and think, are they asking me about the computer? Are they asking me about the, the adoption? I have no idea what they're asking me about. So I shall now simply say, I don't know. Guideline number three is the hardest. The, unsolved, the wording of the unsolved problem is split, not clumped. What does that mean? Let me give you some examples of some clumped unsolved problems. Difficulty being safe, clumped. Difficulty getting along with others, clumped. Difficulty reading, clumped. Difficulty doing work at school, clumped. Difficulty doing homework, clumped. Difficulty writing, clumped. Now let me split one of those for you and you'll see where we're heading. What's he having difficulty writing? Oh, he's having difficulty writing the answers to the word problems in math. He's having difficulty writing the lab reports in science. And he's having difficulty writing the um, term paper in English. Those are three separate unsolved problems. You're writing in three different unsolved problems. Why? Because while it is tempting to believe that the kid is having difficulty writing on those three things for the exact same reason, you'll be wrong about that way more often than you're right. Plus, if you keep it clumped, here's what it's gonna sound like when you introduce the unsolved problem to the kid. I've noticed you've been having difficulty writing. What's up? The kid now has to think about all of the assignments he's having trouble writing on, all of the different reasons he's having trouble writing on them. He cannot think about all of that at once, which means you have just once again, greatly increased the likelihood of the kid responding with, I don't know. We're gonna split them and we're gonna ask him about one of them. I've noticed you've been having difficulty writing the answers to the word problems in math. What's up? Because you split it, he's now more likely to talk about it. Once the kid is done helping us understand that, we can then ask, do you think what we now understand about what's making it hard for you to write the answers to the word problems in math also helps us understand what's making it hard for you to write the lab reports in science? As I always say, the answer is either yes or no. If the answer is no, I'm glad we split it. It's not the same. If the answer is yes, I'm still glad we split it because he wouldn't have talked about it if we'd have clumped it. Your new motto, split early. Maybe you can clump later, but if you clump early, you'll never find out. Now, some of you are now starting to come to the recognition that if you're splitting instead of clumping, your list of unsolved problems could end up being very long. 
your list of unsolved problems is going to be as long as your list of unsolved problems is. I don't find that adults fake unsolved problems. And I think you just did the, this kid the favor of a lifetime. You just finally memorialized all of the expectations this kid's been having difficulty meeting, many of them for a very long time. Well done. What a favor. Could 50 unsolved problems be very overwhelming to us? Yes, but I'll tell you what's even more overwhelming than that. Having absolutely no idea what those unsolved problems are. And therefore, having absolutely no idea what we could be busy solving with this kid. Guideline number four. The unsolved problem, the wording of the unsolved problem should be as specific as possible. Making an unsolved problem specific means relying on one or both of two strategies. Strategy number one, asking in the ALSIP meeting, W questions, who, what, where, when. Don't ask why in an ALSIP meeting. If you ask why in an ALSIP meeting, you're gonna be there for the next 30 minutes listening to people's theories. You are not interested in their theories. Strategy number two, then I'll give you examples of both. Asking the question, what expectation is the kid having difficulty meeting? All right, example, let's say somebody in your LSAT meeting proposes the following unsolved problem. Difficulty with the word no. That is a terrible unsolved problem. First of all, it's clumped. You're probably saying no about a lot of things. Secondly, I got a hunch what you're saying no to is behavior signals. Let's find out. Um, let me start with strategy number one. What are you saying no about? I'm saying no, you cannot go to the bathroom 27 times during every math period. Hmm. No is not the unsolved problem. Going to the bathroom 27 times during every math period is the challenging behavior. Um, let me use strategy number two. What, what expectation is the kid having difficulty meeting during math? Oh, he's having difficulty doing the division problems on the worksheet in math. Strategy number one, what division problems? Double digit division problems. Got it. Now I can write it. Are you telling me he's having, here we go again, difficulty completing, excellent verb, the double digit division problems on the worksheet in math? Yes. Good. Let's write it in. That's how you use the new LSIP. It should be faster. It should be less confusing. That's the goal because we really don't want to let anything get in the way of people using the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems. Once you identify all of the kids' unsolved problems, you then have to prioritize because you can't work on everything at once. Trying to work on everything at once um, is the best way to ensure that nothing at all gets solved. How do you prioritize? Here's my algorithm. Anything that's, any unsolved problem that's causing safety issues is a high priority, safety first. Safety is a big deal in schools and everywhere else these days. Um, plus it's very hard to get people to work together on solving problems if one or both of them is feeling unsafe, safety first. If you don't have safety issues, you're either going with frequency or gravity. Frequency, the unsolved problems that are contributing to challenging episodes most often. Gravity, the unsolved problems having the greatest negative impact on the kid or others. You get to pick three. And how are you keeping track? The problem solving plan. Also, this has not been revised, doesn't need to be. Also available on the Lives in the Balance website in an editable, fillable format. What you're seeing here is three columns. By the way, the problem solving plan in some schools has taken the place of the behavior plan. They're still calling it the behavior plan because they have to but it's the problem solving plan. Three columns, each representing a distinct unsolved problem. Top box, what is the unsolved problem? You got room for three. 
So this is how we're keeping track, both of what we are working on right now with this kid and by process of elimination, what we are not working on right now with this kid. Next box is crucial. Who's taking primary responsibility for solving that problem with that kid? Got to designate somebody, but um, it's not going to be that hard to designate somebody because the ideal person to be solving the problem with the kid is the person whose expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting. And in schools, that is not the principal. That is not the assistant principal. That is not the school psychologist, not the school counselor, not the school social worker. It's whoever expectation the kid is having difficulty meeting. And now you may be starting to understand why the collaborative and proactive solutions model has a pretty stellar track record for reducing or eliminating discipline referrals, detentions, suspensions. First of all, those interventions don't solve any problems. And secondly, those interventions happen when we send our unsolved problems to people who don't know anything about them. Don't worry, we still need the principal, assistant principal, school counselor, school psychologist, school social worker. It's just that their role is going to change. By the way, in some of the schools in which we've seen the ALSEP being used, they've dramatically cut their testing referrals, something most school psychologists jump for joy over. The assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems should be the standard pre-referral triage instrument in every school. Uh, watch your testing referrals plummet. The remaining boxes walk us through the three steps that are involved in solving a problem collaboratively, which once again, we'll be talking about tomorrow. Once the problem is solved, comes off the problem solving plan, and another one from the assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems arrives to take its place. This is how we're keeping track. This is how we're keeping it organized. This is how we're keeping kids and problems from slipping through the cracks. Two sheets, both free, both on the Lives in the Balance website, both available in an editable, fillable format.